so what are the ideological arguments of the Terrans, the Cosmists, and the Cyborgs slash Atelics? Well, let's, let's start with uh, the Cosmists. Right? The, the Cosmists, yeah, based on the word Cosmos, they're the people in favour of building artelects. And they have a, a series of arguments that they uh, use to support the, that humanity should build these artelects. So uh, let's, let's start with the biggest one. Now, I've deliberately chosen the word Cosmist. And it's, I've, I've <laughs> in a, if, if you ask me privately, what, what am I personally? Am, am I a cosmist or, or Terran or cyborg? I would say I'm, I'm cosmist. I, I think it would be tragic if, if humanity chooses to freeze evolution at, at our present puny human level. Puny in comparison to what, could, what humanity could become. So there's, I mean, there's, yeah, <laughs> there's a whole universe out there, right? With all, with all the mysteries and, I mean, our, our, our pathetic little human lives snuffed out in a mere 80 years in a universe that's billions of years old. So that, that, that kind of argument. Now, I, I label that kind of argument the, the big picture argument. Right? So if, if you could be immortal, if you could think a million times faster than you do now, if you have virtually unlimited memory you know, by adding all these technologies to, to yourself. Now in a sense it becomes a philosophical question, what are you, what does you mean? Right? You're not human anymore, you're just drowned, absolutely swamped by, by this intellectual technology, this, this, this capacity. It, it would, vastly drown you as a human being, right? So very, very, very quickly, you're, you're, you're not, you're not, you're not human anymore. So it's a choice to, in a sense, commit suicide as a human and just move on to, to become an, an artelect. Maybe initially in human disguise and eventually you just slough off your human form altogether. And, and become just a pure, a pure artelect. So, um, as, as a Terran, there's, you know, there's virtually no distinction between a cyborg, an advanced cyborg, and a pure artelect, a pure machine. So, I, I can imagine, given the huge numbers, the, the enormous superiority of the intellectual capacities compared to the human brain, that the the cosmos will almost look upon building these godlike machines as a kind of religion. And now, not in the traditional sense. Now, if you ask me where, where do I sit on, on, on the religious fence, I, I will just say, in terms of traditional religions, I, I just sneer at them. They're just superstitions to me. They, they make no sense at all in terms of modern scientific knowledge. They're irrational. And, I have no time for, for religionists, I'll be quite blunt about that. But uh, I am a lot more open to deism. Uh, I'll explain a little what, what, what I mean by that. Um, theism, well, deism is the belief in a creator, that, 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 that our universe was designed, in a sense, engineered by, by some hyper creature, some, some, call it a god, if you like. I'm much more open to that. Why? Uh, uh, speaking as a scientist, because I've had a, you know, scientific training all my life. So, so died in the wool scientist with a scientific mentality and scientific cynicism about claims and you know, people ma make some statement. The, the scientist in me will just say, oh yeah, prove it. <laughs> you know, justify it. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not enough just to, to make hypotheses. You, you need to... to back them up with proof, and so, you know, the, the basic scientific method. So in a sense I can imagine these, these uh, cosmos creating almost a new kind of religion, but science-based, but, but at the emotional 
level, having all the characteristics of, of religion, like in the sense of awe-inspiring, right? Build, building artifacts would be truly awe-inspiring, uh, energizing, uh, giving a sense of direction and purpose to, to, to people's lives, which, which you know, a lot of religions try to do, right? But this time, science-based. So it'd be a kind of, kind of new religion. So, so I see uh, the cosmos pushing cosmism as, as a kind of religion, in, in a sense. So the, the, the religious argument. So the big picture argument, the religious argument, uh, that they, they would feel that they are building gods. And that's all inspiring. Right? So, so I see the primary emotion felt by, by the cosmos as awe, A-W-E. Now, there, there are other arguments, uh, I'll give you th at least three more, and I can imagine uh, you know, other people will dream up other arguments in, in favour of cosmism as, as ideologists. Uh, one is, uh, well, like the, the Mount Everest syndrome. Yep. Why do people risk their lives <laughs> trying to climb Mount Everest? That mountain has claimed many lives, right? Why do people do this? You know, for a lot, of, a lot of people, it seems sort of crazy. It's insane. You know, why risk your life doing something that doesn't seem to make much sense? Well, uh, a lot of people claim it's part of human nature to strive. Right? It's, it's in our genes. We're, we're curious creatures. And curiosity has survival value. Because if you're curious, you will go sniffing around to try to find other ways of doing things. And you know, that... that that can be advantageous. If you find a, a newer, better way of doing something, it may increase your chances of survival. Okay? So there's, there's an evolutionary Darwinian advantage to being curious, to, to, to sniffing around. So it's probably built into our genes to, to strive, to push, to push the boundaries. Right? So it's probably just part of human nature to, to want to do the next best big thing. Right? So, so cosmism is probably the, the major challenge for humanity in the 21st century. And in a sense, because it's programmed into us in our genes, you can't stop it. Right? So that's a pretty, pretty powerful argument. So the human striving can't be stopped argument. Now, there are two others. Uh, I call them momentum arguments. Like, how do you stop it? Because the momentum behind the trend is so powerful, it's virtually unstoppable. And, and of two sorts, economic and military, right? given the time frame we're, we're talking about. So firstly, economic. Uh, so in the 2020s, we will probably see the rise of artificial brain-based home robots and zillions of other applications where artificial intelligence is incredibly useful. So these new industries that don't exist yet, but soon, you know, they're developing as we speak, these, these industries will come into being and be worth trillions of dollars a year. Right? Major industries. They'll be the future Microsofts and Googles and, and so on of, of, of the next decade and the next, next decade. So with such enormous amounts of money and power involved, and all the politics that goes with all that, and employment and, and so forth, how do you stop it? Right? it? It would require a major political counterforce to stop that momentum. With just the, the, all, all, all this infrastructure behind pushing, building, building these ever increasingly intelligent devices. The, the market forces would be huge. So how, how on earth do you stop it? And the other one is military. Now, I live in China. Now, as a Westerner, and most Westerners who are informed about China have a hatred of the Chinese government. Why? Because it's the greatest criminal organization in history. It has killed, mostly under Mao Zedong, has killed 80 million people. That's more than Stalin or Hitler. Hit Stalin's reckoned to have killed about 60 million in his purges and so on. And Hitler in the Second World War, roughly about 50 million. So the West 
is waiting with great impatience for China to convert to a democracy. Right? Now that probably happened about 10 years or so, given, given the rise of the Chinese middle class, there are already about 100 million of them, between 100 and 200 million, depending on how you define middle class. But it's always, history shows that uh, over the last half century, about 100 countries in the world, that's half of them, half of the countries in the world, have switched over the last 50 years from one-party dictatorships to multi-party democracies. Right? It's a global trend at roughly, well, you can calculate it, roughly about two countries per year. So that only leaves about 120 something countries today that are democracies. Two thirds of countries today are democracies. So it's, it's, it's democratization is a global phenomenon. So China, China will go the same way and it, it will not be the last country in the world to, to switch to. to. So um, if, if they're smart, if, if the Chinese Communist Party is intelligent, it can actually use this trend, the, 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 the inevitability that China sooner or later will democratize and hence civilize, become a modern country, just part of its general modernization. It's a necessary step. Uh, so the party can anticipate this and actually use it to its, its advantage by saying to the Chinese people, hey, look, do you really want your country run by a bunch of amateurs who have no experience running a government and therefore see the world's highest economic growth rate evaporate? It's a powerful argument. They may, they may actually win if, if they pitch it correctly. But say they don't. Say, imagine they're just so corrupt and so evil that they're so hated by the Chinese public that they don't dare try to, you know, this, this strategy, because they, they may feel that they just, they would lose. So they just simply hold on to power as long as they can. Well, imagine they do do that, and it goes on 10, 20 years before, before the switch. Okay? So then what happens? Well, China's 1.3 billion people. America is 0 0.3 billion people, right? Much, much smaller. But today, 2010, America is the world's dominant culture, right? Wins all the Nobel Prizes, sets the pace, changes the planet, right? It's, it's the most creative, dynamic culture on the planet. But its days are numbered, right? It's too small. If, if America wants to be a player, a significant player, later in the 21st century, it will have to do what Europe is doing. In other words, become bigger. Right? For, for example, um, Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, she is proposing to, to Washington that the European Union, the EU, and NAFTA, North American Free Trade Area, Canada, America, Mexico, that those two should combine to create an Atlantic Union. Why? To be able to compete later in the 21st century with the power, the size of the giants, the billion club of China, India, 